Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I am David Chute. I am the founder of Rody. We do batteries included backstage with scorecards and zero maintenance. Uh, the developer portal journey starts for me in 2015. Um, I joined Workday as an engineer and wrote kind of the first line of code on a developer portal that we used internally to uh, allow deployment on some internal platforms that we had. I became a product manager there, uh, and eventually like that, pro that project became kind of so successful that I was interested in starting a company. Quit uh, Workday in 2020 during the first lockdowns of the pandemic and uh, started a company. Backstage happened to be open sourced around the same time, and it seemed like a good mix, so I put the two things together. We've so far deployed more than 300 companies to production on Backstage, and we are currently focused on uh, making Backstage easier to adopt and uh, enabling people to measure the maturity of the software that their teams are building with scorecards and various other features. Okay, so about six months ago, you know, I had this interest in learning about the best practices for adopting Backstage, and I decided let's go talk to some uh, self-hosted adopters, right? Because there's obviously people at this point who have been in this community for three years, Backstage is three years old. There's definitely some lessons out there that we can learn, and then we can share them like this to uh, a wider audience. So I did kind of what you would expect, uh, the simplest thing. I went to the adopters.md file in the repository, started at the top, reached out to everybody and tried to set up some calls with people. Um, got a pretty good response uh, and just kind of sat down with people and just asked them some basic questions. Like things like, how do you populate your catalog and have you tried to use the scaffolder? Um, compiled all of these answers together and uh, resulted in the presentation that you see here. So a couple of potential sources of error in this presentation that I want to talk about first, right? One, you know, I didn't necessarily ask the exact same questions in every single interview. They weren't uh, surveys. This was just me trying to have conversations with people and uh, let them talk a little bit. So I had to kind of, you know, uh, fudge the data when presenting it in this type of format. Also, the people that I was speaking to probably have some biases. If you've been working on setting up the backstage scaffolder and trying to make it a success inside your company for six months, and then somebody comes along and asks you, is it a success, you're probably incentivized to say yes. So just keep that in mind. Secondly, you know, I'm probably biased in the way I interpret these answers. There was some interpretation on my, my uh, behalf, and so that might show up in the data too. I also have some quotes here. Um, now, I have anonymized the quotes. I've given some context on the... The, the, the size of the companies and the amount of experience that they have, but I haven't bothered putting logos because that would require going through the legal and marketing departments of a bunch of companies, and I just didn't have time to do that. Um, so you're gonna have to believe me that they are real quotes. Some of the people who gave them are in the room and, and they can verify later on. So just in terms of demographics and who I talked to, uh, most of the companies were less than 500 engineers in size. The um, smallest was 80. It's a good few in the kind of 100 to 250 engineers uh, size, and then there was some 500 engineer companies in there too. We had two companies who were 500 to 1.5K engineers, and we had five companies who were 2,000 or larger, so pretty big enterprises. Um, quite a bit of experience, you know, I was selecting for people who had a lot of experience with Backstage. I probably did 26, 27 interviews in total and just kind of discarded some people who were really only getting started. Uh, the point of this is to learn how to adopt Backstage, not how to deploy Backstage, and so I was trying to focus on people who had actually been working with that for quite a while. Um, yeah, so a lot of people had two years or more experience. Some of the earliest adopters actually were people I talked to too. Okay, so let's just look at quantitative stuff for a moment. I think most of the value in, in, in this uh, exercise was in the qualitative data, but the rest of, there is some quantitative data that we can look at too and just kind of you know, understand what that might teach us. So firstly, source of catalog population. For this, I just asked a basic question, like how do you populate your catalog, okay? Uh, 12 of the 20 companies were relying on catalog info YAML files, which I'm sure we all uh, know and love. Uh, four companies happen to have an existing source an existing catalog that they were able to connect to. And so they had a bit of an advantage as they were getting started. You know, they already had a catalog in place. They just come in, connect backstage to it, and voila, they have a, a beautiful catalog there. Some companies invested in custom processors. And I'm going to say, I'm going to kind of um, bucket a lot of things together when I say custom processors here. Really what I mean is connecting to some sort of source and scraping the catalog out of there without relying on engineers to create the YAML files themselves. So, for example, in one case, uh, a company had built a custom processor for GitHub, which would just read 
the repositories, it would look for a CircleCI config file and try and use that to figure out the annotation for CircleCI, things like that. Scaffolder was broadly successful across the whole cohort. So out of 20 companies, nine hadn't tried to use the Scaffolder for various different reasons, but the, everybody who did try to use it had reported success. Um, not a single company tried the Scaffolder and failed to get any value out of it. TechDocs, a bit more of a mixed bag. Um, six companies reported that they had success with uh, TechDocs. Six companies reported that they had tried to use TechDocs and failed to drive significant adoption of it. Six companies just hadn't really tried yet, and two companies I forgot to ask about TechDocs, so that's why they are there as unknown. Um, we'll get into the details on this a bit later and why this might be, but this is just the data up front. Okay, maturity metrics. So uh, what I mean by maturity metrics, just to explain, is uh, measuring some aspects of the quality of the software that teams are developing, okay? It could be security, it could be reliability, it could be operability, um, compliance. Rolling these, all these things up, I call that maturity. So interestingly, almost half of the 20 companies I talked to had invested their own engineering time into building some sort of maturity measurement features into Backstage. Uh, they dedicated actual engineering hours to this. There's a couple of different ways that they do it. I'll talk a bit about those later. Um, but I think it's interesting that teams are actually investing in this area. Even of the companies, the half of the, the, the group who hadn't built anything, half of those were thinking about it and, and planning to invest in this area too. Plugins, again, kind of a mixed bag. Like Tech Docs, um, eight companies reported trying to uh, drive adoption of plugins inside their company and failing. Six were too early. Um, four companies reported succeeding, and there's kind of different ways that they talked about it. Some, uh, like half of them basically said, yeah, we put in open source plugins and they seem to be adding value and, and people are going to the catalog to use those. Two had succeeded with, with plugins, but really felt like they'd only uh, added most of the value with custom plugins for workflows that existed only inside their company. All right, cool, so that's the data. That's kind of like the pieces I was able to pick out. But what have I actually learned from the interviews? And we could talk a bit about uh, some of that stuff. Firstly, templates can be a really e easy and early win, um, and probably is a good place to start with Backstage. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, you know, if you think about templates, you can just write a template, put it into Backstage, send somebody a link, they can run it, and they get value straight away. There's no cold start, cold start problem. This is kind of in contrast to something like the catalog where it's a bit like Facebook, there's network effects. The more stuff that's in the catalog, the more reason people feel like they have to put stuff into the catalog. And so it takes a bit of time for it to build up. Templates, you can just get started straight away. Second thing is that there's an easy to calculate ROI for scaff scaffolder templates, right? If you take a job that used to take two months, you make it 15 minutes, you multiply that by the number of times that that job is run each year, and you multiply that by something about something close to what an engineer costs, and you can basically report upwards, well, we saved you know, X hundred thousand dollars with the scaffolder. Um, that's good when you're trying to adopt a new technology, because you want to get an early win. You want to have something to report success so that you can continue to invest more and more into other features of Backstage. Um, not all companies you know, had equal success with the scaffolder. The ones who reported the most success kind of did two things. One, they tried to automate frequently uh, run tasks, okay? If you imagine a job that's only run once a year, the actual steps that you need to run have probably changed by the time you get around to running it again. And so there's not that much value in, in uh, automating that with the scaffolder. So things that happen very frequently, the templates uh, tended to stay up to date more frequently or more easily, and, and those worked out better. Obviously, uh, more arduous tasks are also better to automate. They just cost more to, to kind of follow all the steps, and they're a good starting point. With the Scaffolder, I think it's important also to encourage contribution. So some companies who come to me for sales calls and things like that, they kind of want, have this idea that they want to lock down the Scaffolder and um, keep it for only some anointed people, architects or uh, platform engineers who are allowed to write the scaffolder templates and uh, other people will come along and run them. The companies who seem to have the most success with Backstage, laptop just went to sleep, um, allowed anybody to contribute, okay? And they had actually built ways to figure out which were the trusted scaffolder templates from the UI. So you could uh, come along, let's say, and see certified labels on certain scaffolder templates because they had been blessed by the 
uh, platform engineers who were responsible for the overall reliability and, and uh, consistency of the Scaffolder templates. And so we've obviously, obviously copied that idea into Rody and we have that supported out of the box. Here's some quotes about the Scaffolder. Um, I won't read them all, but like just picked out some, some points here that I bolded. Scaffolder is the king feature of Backstage, I heard from somebody. Uh, We've reduced some tasks from a month to a few minutes. Okay? We have customers, Caribou, who were up on the stage here last year saying exactly the same thing. They took a two-month task and made it 15 minutes with the scaffolder. The ROI on that is obvious. Um, and then Lunar have obviously publicly also said that they've uh, locked down GitHub because they've been so successful with the scaffolder. There's no other way to create uh, microservices there. Second big thing to think about, I think, is making catalog population easy, right? This is clear in the data that this is important. Catalog is important because you can't get full value from Backstage unless your catalog is correct, rich, and complete. If you think about measuring software maturity, for example, you can't measure the maturity of something that's not in Backstage, and so this is a really important prerequisite. It's also really difficult, it turns out. Um, so of 12 companies who tried to create a rich and complete catalog with catalog info YAML files, only two of them seem to be successful. One of them is a kind of a special case that I'll talk about in a second. Um, other people seem to reach about 25% catalog completeness after a significant amount of effort and uh, didn't get any further than that. There's a couple of things that you can do to help. So Twilio, who I actually didn't interview, but I saw this recently and I thought it was interesting, are reporting uh, catalog completeness numbers inside Backstage in a very public way, which is helping them drive adoption. They have this uh, feature called Catalog Health, and it reports numbers like you know, what percentage of uh, components have a sneak annotation or a page duty annotation, stuff like that, which seems to be um, uh, really helping them. They actually spoke about this at the Autodesk Developer Productivity Conference, which happened recently, and it's recorded on YouTube if you want to check it out. And so uh, I think that that kind of points to the second point there, you know, if you want to have success with the backstage catalog, catalog, it seems that you do need some kind of top-down support. You need a carrot and a stick. Backstage can be great, but you will need some sort of uh, a force, whether it's you know, public metrics, which are a company goal that everybody's working towards, or even maybe uh, locking down deployment of new services to things that are in the catalog. Something like that will help drive success with catalog info YAML files. I mentioned a special case a second ago, um, and it really kind of comes down to this. You might be thinking, well, okay, it's easy to create files. We'll just open an automated pull request against all of the repositories that we have. We'll put a catalog info file in there. We will explain what the benefits of merging this thing are, uh, and then that's how we'll drive completion of our catalog. Now, I've personally seen mixed results with this. Um, there's a couple of different obstacles. It depends on your culture. I've seen cases where companies have tried this path and some factions inside the organization have just opted out. They just say, we're not gonna merge that. We don't wanna be involved. We don't see what's in it for us. Other people will just merge it without actually looking at it or reading it and you'll end up with a catalog which has a lack of ownership uh, when it comes to the components in it. So I think the best thing to do here is to start small um, and take your time. You also need to con consider the, the day two operations when you take this path. So if you have some success with the automated pull request and you end up with 800 components in the catalog and then you decide you want to use the sneak plugin, well now you need to annotate 800 components with their sneak service ID and that's not that easy either. You're going to be waiting a long time for those pull requests to get merged. Mono repos are the special case where this actually seems to work. So I did speak to a company who had a gigantic mono repo with 2,000 components in there and they had basically just scripted it so that it created catalog info YAML files for every directory in the mono repo. They got one really trusted person to, merge, to review and merge the pull request, and bingo, they had a, a populated catalog. So if that's your setup, this approach may be able to work. Otherwise, you're just going to have to start slow. You're going to have to take your time, get a group of people who are early adopters, uh, get them into the catalog, make their metadata rich, install a bunch of plugins that work really well, use those to evangelize backstage to the rest of the organization. And you just can't skip that evangel evangelization step. Uh, you're going to have to meet with a lot of people. You're going to have to put boots on the ground. And you're going to have to kind of encourage people to take part. The most successful way to populate a catalog is via integration with an existing service catalog, which is maybe not all that helpful if you don't have one, 
or custom processors. Seven companies who tried one of these methods succeeded uh, out of seven, right? So 100% success rate. There's a couple of different things that people did. I mentioned earlier on one company had uh, built a custom processor for GitHub, which scraped their repos. They had a fairly consistent setup, which allowed this to work, and they were kind of, you know, uh, very upfront about that. And they didn't think this would work for every company, but it did work for them. Uh, Lunar, again, built a Kubernetes operator, which sits in a production cluster, scrapes uh, software from there, and then bootstraps the catalog from that. And in that case, all, all that engineers need to do is kind of claim ownership of things, right? Casper has talked publicly about that before. That's an interesting case that I think deserves a bit more attention. So in summary, I think YAML is a long and hard road. Uh, I think you need to be careful about setting off down that way. I think all existing registries and automated discovery are key for a backstage catalog, completeness, correctness, and richness. I'd love to see more focus from the community in this area. We are doing some stuff in Rhodey around decorating entities. Twilio actually independently did the same thing, but you can now annotate components in Rhodey without editing the YAML. No pull request needed. You just set annotations in the UI, and uh, we see success with that. We're also looking at ways to bootstrap catalogs from integrations with Argo CD, Kubernetes, and other places where you would have your production software deployed. Okay, Tech Docs. Um, so Tech Docs worked in about half the companies that tried it. The main difference between those where it worked and those where it didn't was the lack of the existence of a technical documentation tool that people were already happy with. Uh, confidence doesn't count, but there are tools out there where people are kind of happy to, to use them, and in that case you will struggle, or the, the uh, people I interviewed struggled, to get adoption for Tech Docs. It also the, needs a bit of a culture shift in some organizations. It is a docs-like code approach. Uh, you do lose some things with that approach, right? It's a bit easier, or sorry, a bit more difficult to edit documentation. You have to open a pull request. You need to know how to do that. You need to be semi-technical. And there is a trade-off there, and some organizations just didn't want to make it or couldn't make it happen, and so they uh, struggle for that reason. Organizations who did succeed with Tech Docs also se seem to put some investment into reducing the friction of using Tech Docs. So they would, for example, create a scaffolder template which allowed people to easily add uh, a docs directory and an mkdocs config file to their repositories. So that's something we're looking at. API specs also can be quite successful. Um, the best example of this is Zalando, and they've publicly said that they have 43% daily active usage of Backstage, and one of the key use cases is basically engineers looking up API specs. Now, the thing about Backstage is your API specs are not going to magically appear in Backstage just because you've deployed it. You're going to have to invest in collecting those API specs, putting them in Backstage, making them versioned, making them searchable. These are things that don't necessarily come out of the box with Backstage. Um, Zalando have built all of that. They have a pipeline for introspecting their services and producing API specs and pushing them into Backstage where they are versioned and searchable. And we're doing similar things in Rhodey. Plugins then, again, I mentioned, you know, quite important, a bit divisive um, in terms of the success that people have had. The thing about plugins, and actually two, interviewer, two people I interviewed specifically said this, is you need to be intentional about which plugins you use, right? Both of these companies, I got really excited at the start, threw in all the open source plugins that they thought that they might use, confused people, they were kind of broken, the catalog wasn't ready for it, and they ended up taking them back out again. So I think it's worth thinking first from a kind of product standpoint, what are we actually trying to do? What are the use cases that we're trying to solve for engineers? And then install or build plugins around that. Custom plugins that you build yourself seem to add more value than the open source ones. Obviously, the open source ones are quite generic. They just do basic functions for uh, a lot of SaaS tools, like GitHub Actions, for example, where you can see your CI and, and re-trigger jobs. Those didn't say, seem to drive a lot of usage because engineers would still can, uh, prefer to go to GitHub Actions, which they're used to using every day and, and has more functions anyway. So plugins best succeed when they enable engineers to do something that they can't do otherwise or something which has really high friction, okay? There's probably a lot of these things in your company because you're gonna have legacy or custom workflows which need to be executed uh, fairly regularly and can be a little bit friction to do. Those are the best things to put in the backstage. And then again, like I said, empower other teams, right? The best companies who had the most custom plugins seemed to have a model where they would consult with other teams, but they wouldn't build plugins for them. 
So they would either empower them with scaffolder templates to create new custom plugins more easily, and they would consult and, and, and kind of embed with these teams to give them the skills, but they weren't building plugins on their team's behalf because those teams have the domain expertise to do it best. Lastly, I want to talk about uh, software maturity metrics. So this, like I said, half the companies in the, in, the, uh, in the interviews that I did had built their own software maturity metrics into Backstage. Couple of different ways they do it. Um, two companies had basically built a custom plugin which would ask questions of the owner of the software directly inside Backstage. You'd fill out, you know, kind of feels like, does your software use, uh, have customer data? Or what data store does it use? This kind of stuff. And then they would uh, record these answers once a month or once a quarter. Some manager would fill it out and it would certify the software and represent that inside, inside Backstage some way. So that was one way to do it. Second way to do it was a bit more automated. Um, so some companies had basically built visualizations into Backstage where you could see aggregate metrics of the uh, versions of dependencies being used, right? So answer questions like what percentage of our catalog is using a certain version of a certain library. That was a popular thing also, and a couple of companies had done that. I think the thing, the interesting thing about this is that you can actually get a lot of value out of, out of it without having really high daily active usage of Backstage. So it does take time to build up that daily active usage and make it a place where people go really regularly. In the meantime, you can be getting a lot of value on the kind of compliance and governance side by investing in this area. It's also something that shows uh, decent ROI and um, people who bless projects need to care about. But like I said, it does require completeness, correctness, and richness in your catalog. You can't apply automated checks to software that's not in the catalog, and you need to have high richness so that you can map pager duty to the backstage catalog if you want to create a check, which is like production software must be in pager duty. All right, so in summary, I'm three minutes left. From kind of this research and a lot of the sales calls I've done, I see two paths. Uh, that work with Backstage, or two paths that people want to take. Uh, they're kind of mapped to the Create, Manage, Explore um, nomenclature that we've seen before, where discoverability is Explore and increase software maturity is uh, Create and Manage. And uh, you can do both if you want to invest in it, but you do need to do some work regardless, right? You're not going to just deploy Backstage and on day one get really high value from either of these paths. You need to put some work in. If you want to improve discoverability, the thing to do is automate catalog collection. It's always automate catalog collection. You don't have to start there, but you do have to automate it as far as I can see. Look at tech docs, look at API specs, make those things available. They will drive that kind of daily active usage, that discoverability, and then invest in custom plugins. Work with teams to find workflows where more automation is needed, easier ways to do things are, are needed, and empower them to create plugins that go on the backstage. It's going to require patience. Um, it's just going to take a bit of time. Uh, even companies who've been working on it for two years sometimes still feel like they're you know, early on this journey. Um, but it can result in high daily active usage. We see this from Spotify. We see it from Zalando and other people who have been willing to put the work in to, to do this. The second path is to increase software maturity. Uh, equally valuable, just slightly different. You start with automating catalog collection. You invest in scaffolder templates because by giving people the tools that they need to create new software with the best practices of the organization baked into them, you have a good starting point for improving the standardization and henceforth the maturity of that software. And then you likely need to build your own tools or purchase one of the tools like what Rody has with Tech Insights, Spotify has with Soundcheck to measure software maturity with scorecards and other technologies across the catalog. This way won't see high daily active usage, which I think is kind of a weird thing to say when it comes to Backstage, because we talk about it empowering developers, um, and people kind of expect people to, developers to wake up and spend their time in Backstage. You won't necessarily achieve that with this path, but it is valuable all the same, and improving the maturity, compliance, security, and reliability of your software is highly valuable. That's it for me. If you want to give me feedback, you can scan this QR code, apparently and it'll uh, let you yell at me. You can also email me there at david at rody.io. I'm um, happy to talk to people about Backstage. It's what I do, and thank you very much. <laughs>